Um, our next speaker is um, Advocate Zanyue uh, Atari uh, Ntatisi. She's the, the director at a, a company called Digitally Legal. Um, and, and her topic will be um, awareness, literacy, and adoption of PAPIA for economic development. Advocate Ntatisi, are you there? I am here, Cesar. Thank you so much for having me. Right. Can you speak up a bit and you can switch on your camera? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Right. Um, unfortunately, I will not be sharing my screen or my presentation as uh, we've just, as I um, informed you, have been hit by, I'm not, I don't think it's load shedding, I think a generator in the area in Branson that we're working from. So I will just be reading, um, my, or presenting my presentation and then I will present the actual presentation afterwards, um, post facto for, for purposes of perusing by um, the fellow participants and, and colleagues. So by way of introduction, as, as Cesar has, has, has put for me, I am Advocate Zanyu Ntati Siasare. And today I'll be presenting um, Papaya or Personal Information, the Act of Personal Information, the Act of the Protection of Personal Information Act, um, which then I will break down and discuss from the lens of awareness, literacy and adoption from the African perspective, African continent. Sorry, I just want to position myself properly. I am now, what I will be talking to or speaking to you about today is in my experience one as a advisory panelist to government based ICT development projects for marginalized and, and um, uh, marginalized people in South Africa, where we essentially look at work for adoption of ICT policies, including the likes of data protection from a continental um, and regional perspective. What we generally discuss when we look at the data subject relationship through the consumer versus business relationship is how the two have um, a very unequal, unequal um, bargaining power and unequal um, positioning. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry. Oh, pardon me. Unequal positioning when it comes to um, when it comes to the protection of personal information when when interactions, especially commercial activities, take place. Um, Caesar, I'm so sorry. I I don't know if you can see my screen. I you hear see. all these noises. No, no, we can. can you hear we me? can hear you. Everything is fine. You can proceed. Okay, great. So essentially what we're discussing today is the consumer-based relationship and the power dynamics that we look at from an economic relationship and, and how we understand papaya in that. So as I introduced in my capacity um, as a member and consultant for government-based um, ICT um, initiatives, uh, my, in my capacity as well as digitally legal, we understand that when it comes to the understanding of rights, especially for South Africans and Africa at large, we only understand rights on a needs by basis. And that's why it's important for us to discuss awareness, literacy and adoption today. So as a continent, we find ourselves in a place where 4 adoption has increased exponentially, not to the point where that's the sole method of, of, of um, um, so method of, of interacting or so method of um, economic activity in the continent, but with the penetration of ISP and internet service providers on the continent and the increase of internet usage and people understanding or companies and businesses and even governments understanding that there needs to be a transfer of the physical world interaction to um, digital based inter interaction, data protection is needed. As we have this discussion, I want to highlight that I will be speaking specifically on digital-based um, processing of data. However, when we speak of data protection and the protection of personal information in particular, this is not specifically for digital-based. It also um, encompasses uh, physical files that are kept and physical files that have 
um, personal information of individuals and organizations. So now just to jump into it from a statistics perspective, um, from an economic policy pos uh, position, Africa has seen the need of creating um, of, of, of creating the African continental free trade, which essentially highlights how we have moved from a more traditional based or uh, a traditional base of with um, inter oh, sorry country based um, trade. And we essentially are now looking at capitalizing on the 1.2 billion population that we have as, 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 as Africa and also looking at the gross domestic um, product of uh, $2.5 trillion that, that we uh, basically produce every year as a continent. Now, when we take away the borders um, from a trading perspective, the real question here is what happens to the processing of cross or trans um, cross cross-border transfer of, of information. So if we look at it from a trade perspective, trade is highly dependent on this data processing. So what do we do from an African perspective? I think for purposes of this conversation, we will specifically be speaking or talking to um, Papaya and um, also looking at it from a South African perspective. Now, I'd like to highlight a few examples of what awareness looks like from a South African perspective. For 24, for, for, for 24 years, this is up until 2018, South Africa had been experiencing a high scourge of um, domestic or gender-based violence and femicide. And women gathered together to you know, you know, make noise. They rallied media, they rallied government, they rallied private sector to essentially have a discussion and, 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 and call the president to do something about gender-based violence and femicide. And what happened in the space of 24 months, this is from 2018 to date, um, surpassed what happened in 24 years. So this speaks to how the African continent relates to rights. So for instance, if we look at the right to privacy, which is um, given or conferred by section 14 of the constitution, we see that people don't necessarily understand their right. They don't necessarily see it in the same manner that they would approach, let's say, gender-based violence. And the reason why I highlight this is people generally only want to interact with their specific rights when they see that there's dire need, number one. Number two, when they realize that it directly affects them. And number three, when they see that it directly affects a citizen or a, a loved one who is a citizen in, uh, within this context. Now, how do we how do we do this? Um, by illustrating this, I, I I do believe that one we are already in the right step as colleagues today here discussing this. But we there's more that needs to be done from a literacy perspective. So, what does um, awareness and literacy mean? Awareness and literacy, or you know, the definition of awareness here would be to be in the know, to be knowledgeable to have a, a concept, a conceptual, conceptual understanding of the data protection, um, data protection scene and what that means for the individual. One, breaking down the eight principles of papaya, so one, understanding what accountability means, um, what processing limitation means, what um, uh, purpose specific means for the processing limitations, um, accountability, security safeguards and from a tech and organizational perspective, and also um, data subject um, participation, not just from an information quality perspective, but also understanding what the data processing value chains mean in a environment like Africa, where data processing has gone highly unsupervised for a number of years and has been tapped into by various actors. Now, what we have done as Digital Legal is we have put together a program called Cyber citizen. What cyber citizen does is it breaks down the legislation to a very human level where someone might not even and might not even realize at that point in time in our dissemination of information that they are interfacing or interacting with legislation. So what we do is we approach schools, we've worked with a number of schools, we've worked with a number of parastatals who've got the mandate to educate um, educate individuals from, you know, from youth to young adults to, um, or children rather to young adults to adults themselves 
who happen to be participants in this data subject um, responsible party or rather consumer business relationship and even in most in instances um, citizen and government um, relationship now when it comes to uh, now adoption or sort of adoption of this whole uh, you know, data processing literacy and, and acting in accordance with the knowledge that has been attained or acquired by a data subject. The real question here is continental participation when we do speak about, uh, you know, for instance, loosening or, or, or easing the concept of borders in, in, in trades. As we currently stand, there are only 11 countries in Africa that have actual um, data, data, and or data protection authorities. And now the real question here is, from an African perspective, how do we leverage on the numbers? For instance, the 1.2 billion that we sit on right now is Africa. How do we leverage on the numbers to ensure that one, from a, um, a internal continental perspective, we are one utilizing this for economic benefit. Um, two, that we are also ensuring that we are encouraging and um, pushing for the adoption of, of, of knowledge acquisition when it comes to data protection and the rights and also showing businesses how this can actually help them. So a small example to, 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 for, for, for us today, um, when it comes to the processing of personal information of 1.2 billion people is looking at all the goods that come in to Africa. So for instance, let's say we have a, we have a uh, company X and company X um, delivers fridges. And this company X wants to now set up a data center or a center where they've got a call center where they deal with after sales, troubleshooting, and um, where they interface directly with data belonging to African data subjects or personal information belonging to data subjects. If we as a continent sit down, even from a space where we have our separate data protection laws, but we all make sure that they're based on the eight principles or the common, common principles of data protection, um, um, sorry, um, from data protection, we then understand that we are sitting in a position of, of, of high immense power from a bargaining position, but also we know that we can then create jobs from that opportunity where we know that we've now placed our specific conditions from a data protection perspective to service our own 1.2 billion. In the same breath, we can then also service international actors, international clients who speak similar languages. As we know as Af um, from an African perspective, we've got Francophone Africa and French speaking Africa, and we've got um, the English uh, Anglophone speaking Af Anglophone Africa. Now, the question here is how do we get that done? That comes from a literacy, literacy perspective. Now, one of the things which is unfortunate, I, I can't project my screen right now uh, because the machine that I'm meant to be using does not have electricity. But um, one of the things that we obviously would have to discuss from a data protection perspective is how we break this down to, um, into school, schooling curriculum, because this is quite important. Now, from a schooling curriculum um, perspective, Digital Legal, alongside of its partners, are working with um, the Department of Education to uh, put, uh, sorry, I think someone's, um, I can't, I'm, I'm hearing myself, someone's speakers on. Sorry. Okay, pardon me with that. Um, so from a, pardon me, from a schooling perspective, we have broken down with data protection of the subject that I, citizenship. So what is, what does that mean? Subject being so anonymous of citizenship means that when a person understands themselves, they do not understand themselves solely as a recipient of the physical sense. They also understand that they are
sorry, apologies for that. Um, where where there's education from from that space. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. And then we go into tertiary institution for people that have obviously skipped that from, you know, an opportunity from starting that from foundational phase, where we now look at what the relationship with um, actual high institutions of higher learning are when it comes to the data processing, um, data processing procedures and, and processes. The question here is how are universities one incorporating this um, important aspect of you know modern life or modern modern living in in their schools so for instance if you look at what has happened now over the COVID period um, a lot of information or data processing for for, for very simplest for very simple um, interactions or very simple um, sort of relationships that, that that the student and the university would have have been created. So you go into the building and now all of this information is, is being collected. How do we keep places of higher learning accountable from that perspective? But now when we're going to the classroom, how do we ensure that, um, that, that, that this is incorporated? So for instance, when we look at business, um, business-based, um, sorry, business-based, uh, business-based uh, 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 courses, are we creating, when we look at the concepts of King 4, are we creating um, individuals who will go into the work is, workspace already having this knowledge? Are we creating this as a special, are we creating sort of a barrier where data protection becomes a specialized knowledge and not something that anybody who happens to possess education, even at the very basic um, bachelor level, understands that data processing should be, or data processing or data protection laws should be part of how um, business is conducted and part of what an accountable society looks like. Um, now to go to, uh, sorry, I actually need to do this. To go to, what do you mean? Yep. To go to um, what we are now uh, 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 basically putting out there as digitally legal. So as digitally legal, what we have done is we have um, done some research um, and we worked alongside the CSIR to understand where we currently stand with um, South Africa. So statistically speaking, we did a survey where we um, sat hand in hand with a hundred people from different backgrounds and only 10, actually 8.9% 8, 8. 8 of the people understood what data protection was. And when we did a further investigation, these were people that were in the financial service sector and also had a legal background. That is extremely problematic for a, uh, for a place like Africa, where we've mentioned we've got 1.2 billion people that are slowly but surely penetrating the internet, um, that are so slowly but surely penetrating internet usage and e-commerce um, participation. So where we currently sit is a, uh, quite quite a precarious um, position where uh, we sorry just let me do this um, we, we sit in quite a precarious position where we have um, the skill set to educate our people but also we also uh, sit in a position where our literacy literacy levels are quite low from um, the stats South Africa uh, from 2018 South, South Africa, we know that at the age of 10, South Africans still do not have a, a literacy level that is on par with the rest of the continent. And um, the issue here is that how do we then disseminate this information? How, how do we then disseminate this information to people who are barely literate? And also, how do we disseminate this information to a country that has a lot of um, quick kids are, I don't, okay, thank you. Um, where people basically, uh, where peace, sorry, where we have people who are essentially illiterate and do not understand any other form of information being disseminated outside of their mother tongue. So there's a big, there's a big, uh, there's a big um, space for this legislation, but also a human relatable manner of dissemination to be translated into indigenous languages or African languages, other African languages, 
and also for it to be translated to um, translated in a manner that accommodates differently abled individuals. So now, what is, you know, it's unfortunate that I, I don't have my um, presentation because I actually have our, our, um, our interactions with a school for the deaf and um, blind in the free state who've actually embarked on this relationship with Digital Illegal to essentially, like we said, create awareness and literacy and adoption at levels where it's almost like to, these particular fractions of society have been forgotten. Because at the end of the day, when we look at, for instance, the differently, differently abled or disabled community, these are people that are still, you know, a very huge part of the data subject, responsible party or consumer, um, sorry, cons consumer slash um, business relationship. Now, how do we ensure that um, these people are not left forgotten? that the marginal, marginalization is not perpetuated and entrenched in our society. What we essentially do is we invest in, in, in them. We invest in this relationship. Um, but uh, Cesar, I think I might, need to, I might need to go into place with electricity because I need to show this presentation. I'm not sure if um, we can just accommodate for me to just maybe uh, drive to the office and then connect to electricity and do it from there because I think I, 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 I need this. I need the, the data. I think, I think what we can do is considering time as well, um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll allow you to share your presentation with, with the participants and we'll put it up on the website in any event. Um, we, we, we do appreciate that it is South Africa and currently electricity is an issue. <laughs> so don't feel bad about it. Um, maybe what we should do is, is to see if there's any questions from the floor regarding your, your presentation. Uh, are there any questions from the floor regarding this particular presentation? Maybe, maybe just from my side, I'm, I'm very much interested in, in what you said, your, your education uh, and awareness stuff. Uh, do, you, do you literally team up with, with, with government schools and, and, and do awareness there amongst uh, young children? Or, or, or is it mainly with the private schools as, as we would usually see in South Africa? So um, thank you for the question, Cesar. Um, okay, so just to break down the, to just go in depth with the program. So the program is called Cyber Citizen. And what it does is it's got um, different modules to it to become a cyber citizen. So it acknowledges that, you know, life has become digitized and there will be a fraction of people that will be left out if we do not create literacy. So it is, it looks at data protection. It looks at understanding blockchain technology. It looks at intellectual property. Okay, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> um, it looks at intellectual property. It looks at um, various, you know, various literacy programs when it comes to ICT. So just to speak specifically to how we do it, um, what we've done currently is we are working with the CSIR where they, um, where they uh, sort of like adopt a school. So we will have, um, it's, it's generally with private, uh, with public schools. We will have beneficiaries from schools and sometimes not as formal as a school, it will just be um, people over at the age of 10 who understand um, how to use a computer. We will then interact with them either physically before COVID and now obviously based on COVID, we will have a Zoom chat or Zoom link um, such as this one, we will then talk to them, explain what it is, give them our material that we've created, carefully created ourselves, and um, then, you know, have a question and answer. And then when we're done, we give them a certificate of attendance. So we were doing that by ourselves and CSIR has come on board now um, because they, they, they essentially understand that, you know, outside of even data protection itself, we are currently working with, with, with you know, understanding what blockchain technology is, understanding what um, future technologies are, and understanding that in order for, you know, for, for children to have that spark or that interest, we need to get them to understand at a young age. So that, that's essentially how we do it. Um, we haven't yet approached private schools um, because we think that 
you know, that's that's something that that we will do. We want to start with the most marginalized and impoverished of our of our communities because generally they are people that do not get this information given to them and they don't have the funds. So at this point in time where we are being sponsored and we are, you know, carrying a huge part of the costs, we are, you know, attacking or attacking the problem from the root cause by trying to diminish, you know, poverty and trying to diminish um, lack of participation purely based on the fact that people just find themselves in, um, in, in bad economic positions. Okay, I see here there's a comment from um, Amor Burger Schmidt. Uh, she says, the lack of knowledge is indeed a problem, and this covers not only learners, but the general public, but unfortunately also amongst professionals. But one has to start somewhere with the cybercrime. Focusing on learners is definitely of great value. Thank you for that. Um, I see here there's a further comment by Advocate Lufuno Chikalange. I'm interested in understanding how cyber security awareness has been made available to ordinary citizens, or is that not part of their scope? And, and lastly, I see here a co comment from Melvin Lubega. Thank you for the presentation. In terms of reach and partners, especially on digitally legal runs, cyber citizens who are naturally allies from government um, entities perspective. Um, any that, uh, have you engaged any of those? And then um, furthermore, Advocate Chikalange also says, also to understand how awareness programs have an impact on public society. It seems as if cybercrime and cybersecurity are an afterthought. Maybe you, you want to give some concluding remarks to that? Um, so I, I concur, absolutely. Thank you so much for these comments um, and, and questions. So just to, just to um, uh, comment or, or, you know, just to respond to a more, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, it, it's quite problematic and that's why we, we came up with this. And I think your question uh, then sort of correlates or relates to Advocate Lefuno where she's asking, you know, is it available or made available to ordinary citizens? So we're currently working on launching in February to ordinary citizens where um, based on what we've been doing over the past year, we sort of understand what the frequently asked questions are and how to create, to make it more user-friendly and more approachable. And that's why we're starting with, with children. The issue is, and I think it's not just necessarily pertaining to data protection um, in isolation, it's actually to do with rights generally in South Africa, as I'd highlighted in what I said from, from, from um, my talk, was that South Africans typically approach uh, data rights from a need to know basis when they happen to find themselves on the wrong end of, of the law or as a victim of a certain law or you know where where it now becomes a dying need to understand and not necessarily from a place of um, self-development or knowledge and the aim of digitally legal cyber citizen is to do essentially that to create, create a cyber citizen and by definition or with the definition that we created a cyber citizen is someone who is in the know um, is someone who understands their rights, their responsibilities, and knows how to respond in the time of victimization or where there's a breach. They'll know exactly who to go to, where to go to, and even when opportunities arise, how to capitalize on those opportunities. So in February, we'll be launching um, one that uh, we'll be going into companies. So what Digi Digital Legal does from a papaya and data protection perspective, and even just from a regulation and legislation breakdown is we would then work hand in hand with companies to speak directly to what their pain points are. So we've currently worked in the financial service um, FSP space. We've assisted, um, you know, sort of like internal policy creation and framework, cre framework creation. So when it comes to data protection, we're quite excited to do this at um, a, a company level where we speak to companies to, to make them understand that um, a developed uh, employee creates a, a safe environment in a developed um, workspace and a developed company where you're mitigating risk or from a breach perspective because now people are not just leaving data protection to the IT department and to someone who deals just with marketing, but it's sort of like an organizational issue 
and people understand what the actual risks are in everyday life. But even outside of the business focus, individuals need to know because as individuals, as data subjects, it's our data that is being used for analytic and, and it, analytical purposes. It's our data that's being used um, for the success of businesses. And it's really our responsibility to understand how this is being used. And it's also our right as practitioners and, and people in the field or in the industry to, you know, to educate because education um, or awareness creates industry or creates demand for people to be accountable. Uh, a data subject in the know creates an accountable, responsible party. So I don't know if, if, if that's answered um, your, your, you know, comments or just, you know, your comments and, and questions are more and Lufuno. And then when it comes to um, uh, Melvin Lebega, um, thank you so much for that. And I think in terms of the reach with, with partners, you know, we're looking to working with um, the, the, the departments uh, within the country with, from an educational perspective, from um, an ICT perspective, you know, we, we so currently in my work in a personal capacity, I work with um, ICASA on the consumer advisory panel, and we've incorporated a big chunk of, um, of data protection. And recently we worked with uh, Kusatu where we did a training with them, uh, where they had the different industry leaders um, for, for, from around the country. Uh, and they are basically representatives of, of different industries who come in, there were about 160 of them. And they would obviously take this information and disseminate, disseminate that in their constituencies, their followers or the people that they happen to be representing. But we're very keen, very open to work with industry um, and our natural allies obviously would be um, from a government perspective or facets of government because as much as people who work within the government are government, emplo uh, government employees, they are in themselves data subjects. Um, and an informed data subject in their personal capacity creates an accountable society, but in the same breath, when they perform their tasks as um, civil servants or government employees, they then have an element of um, accountability and an element of lawful processing in how they do what they do, which is data intensive or personal inform information intensive. So um, I think if, if, if at this point, we haven't engaged anyone outside of the Department of Education who are keen to assist us, um, you know, with, 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 with talks going on. And currently the CSIR have jumped on board and they're quite, I mean, they're doing pretty well in, in, in consumer education and development. So that's, that's currently who we, we work with so far. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for a lovely presentation there. Um, something different, although the law, something discussing economic aspects um, and, you know, and, and how really data protection uh, is not just a legal matter, but also a, a, a matter of, of economics and, and how it covers and, and how it protects all sectors of the society. Thank you very much for that presentation, Adam. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you for having me. Lovely. Okay.